Hey guys, welcome back to Talking Sass. I am, of course, your host, Sassy Steffi. Make sure you follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, either on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Because believe me, you don't want to miss a second of Talking Sass. Especially this episode, because I have not one, but two guests. That's right. And make sure you stick around to the very end because my second guest is going to come on and give us a little wrestling history lesson. And trust me, it's a really good one. You're not going to want to miss this. But my first guest tonight, he's a former ROH world television champion. He comes from the east side of Cleveland. And we're going to talk about his accomplishments in and out of the ring. His about a thousand different nicknames. Plus, he is the 65th top wrestler in the world, according to PWI this year. So we're going to get his opinions on all of that. So I hope you stick around because I know him as Notorious, but you may know him as the baddest champion you'll ever see. He is Shane Taylor. Welcome to Talking Sass. I am here with the baddest champion you have ever seen one of my very good friends for a very long time this is the one and only Shane Taylor welcome Shane thank you thank you what a great introduction there's a lot of people that could learn from you on these podcasts you know what I mean um they'll just be like you know uh ring of honor star Shane Taylor I'd be like no 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 that's not gonna work (laughs) (laughs) well I think I think it's a little different because we've known each other for a good, like, probably 15 years all together, I would imagine. That's true. That's wild, too, when you think about it. Yeah, we go, we go pretty far back. I mean, even before I started wrestling, I was ring announcing, and we mm-hmm. knew each other from a tiny little bar where you used right. to wrestle every once in a while. You wrestled up pretty much every week there. And I started ring announcing there. So that's that's how far back we go. And that's quite a long time. Absolutely. You know what I mean? But that's that's the beauty of this sport and this business and this industry, you know, is no like you have no idea where things are going to go or how they're gonna progress or who's gonna be doing what in the future, you know, like so to be able to look at guys like myself, Ray Rowe, you know, from 15 years ago plus for him to now is insane you know what I mean like to be able to think some kids from the east side of Cleveland Ohio have gotten to see the world you know and on the precipice of being millionaires some of us you know what I mean like it's it's fucking wild (laughs) definitely and I mean let's talk about that growing up in Cleveland you didn't exactly come from like the greatest background in the world no not at all so why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about that? Because I know the story, but I want you to share it with everybody else. Yeah, like, and that's, my my story is why, you know, I take the stances that I do and I say the things that I do, especially in today's society and with um, as many things that are, are going on with the social injustice and things that sort of that resonates with me because I come from those areas, right? I come from a place where my house was shot up every other week. Like I come from a place where, you know, there were drug dealers on the corner. I come from a place where, you know, we've had people break into the house. I've come from a place where, you know, it's no matter how much your parents tried, no matter how much they cared, no matter how much they tried to steer you the right way, they can only do so much. And if they're working, you know, two, three jobs, you know, they're gone trying to provide you're going to get in shit like you're going to get into trouble because you're going to find people to hang around more than likely the wrong people and it's it's just one of those things right and a lot of people that don't come from those environments don't understand that would never survive in that environment always have the most to say but it's like you don't know right you can't I can't explain to you how this nation looks from my perspective because you've never had my perspective I can't explain to you, you know, what police do to us when you've never had that experience. So you think we're lying, you think we're making stuff up, and then lo and behold, now everything's just being recorded and we're just going, yeah, see, yeah, that's what we said. Like, stuff like that is happening all the time. It's been happening, right? So for me, you know, having a mom who was a teacher, my dad was in the military, you know, busted their ass to make sure, you know, we we had 
everything we needed, you know, but still having those, still having those nights. And, and even now, right, even now, right, the having to go through that, I live in a pretty quiet suburb now, right, but I still don't sleep most nights because I'm wired to stay up and watch my home. You know what I mean? Like, I, I will be up, pacing, traveling, whatever, guns ready. You know what I mean? Like, just in case somebody decides to do something stupid. Now, the odds of that are slim, but it's how I'm wired now, right? So that's what pushes me so hard to be so successful, to be able to use my platform and my voice and be unapologetic about doing so. Because for those that don't understand, for the few of us that do make it, and I'm not even counting myself among that group yet, because I still don't feel like I've made it. I'm still on my way. But for the few of us that made it, it took the entire community to make that happen, right? When you see people, and I know this is a long-winded answer, but for people that don't come from those environments, they have no idea what, the, what people are really like there. And most people don't want to be criminals. They don't condone criminality. They're, they're doing what they feel they have to to survive on limited options, right? So they'll see someone like myself realize that I have talent in a sport or I'm super smart or anything like that. And they will actively pull you away from BS because you don't need to be in the stuff that they're in. They will actually, they will actively pull you away. If you play football and you're good at that and you show promise, but your parents can't afford to buy you the equipment or the shoes, you know, who does the drug dealers. You see what I'm saying? The, yeah. oh, hey, hey, you need shoes. Da, da, da. Just score two touchdowns. Da, 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 da. And like, that's what they do now. I'm not saying they're saints at all. Like, <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? Far from it. Right. They're still the same bad people, but it, it, it sort of makes it this weird thing because yes, they're bad people. Yes, you see them doing bad, but they're also the same people who just bought you those shoes. They're also the same people who are giving out turkeys at Thanksgiving. They're also the same people who are, you know, doing clothes drives and, and things of that sort. So it's a weird dynamic to be from. And if you're not from that, you just don't understand. And me knowing you for as long as I've known you, obviously, I know some of these stories, but you brought yourself out of the neighborhoods that you were in. You mm -hmm. advanced so much in your life. You have a bachelor's degree that you got in business management, which I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of the people in the areas that you were raised in weren't able to afford to go to college in the first place. So right. I mean, you have been extremely successful. And now you're you have your business degree also, but you're continuing this path through wrestling that's just like, all I've seen from Shane Taylor from the time I've met you is just this huge upswing. Mm -hmm. We started, like I said, in that tiny little bar where I met you. We were in a faction together in Cleveland called the uh, Big League. We had hey. a great time in that. Shout out to my man, John Machado. <laughs> we had Big a great League. time. Yeah, and I remember I was actually, ironically enough, going through some old pictures and I found... I don't remember what this circumstance was, but when I joined big league, I have a picture of, of you holding me over top of your shoulder. I don't I know. If, I don't remember yeah. if you were like helping me to the back cause I was injured or if you were like <laughs> kidnapping me. I'm not sure. I, probably a little column a, a little column B. I don't, I don't really, I don't know. You know what I mean? It, it depends. But you were the enforcer there. You were like our group's enforcer. Every, everybody knows not to mess with Shane Taylor. I mean, no matter where you go. And right. so then you go on to even bigger and badder things as you do. I know you mm -hmm. as Notorious, but I love the story that you told me earlier. So mm -hmm. I know you as Notorious Shane Taylor. Now you're the mm -hmm. baddest champion you've ever seen, Shane Taylor. I've ever seen. How many yeah. nicknames do you have? I honestly can't even remember. Like, even I forget some of them, you know <laughs> what I mean? But, like, to me, there was, all, there was always something really cool when I watched Rocky especially Rocky IV, and I watched Apollo Creed come down and, and the ring announcer is introducing him and he's got all these nicknames, like a whole like laundry list of names that he's calling them. And Rock actually looks like, how many nicknames you got? You got he's like, calm down, it's almost done. You know what I mean? But it was just so, 
like no no matter what the name was it all came back to the same guy you know what i mean the name was still respected so whether it's notorious or the baddest champion you've ever seen boy the baddest of all time you know the beast from the east side you know what i mean uh uh i mean there's 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 so many you know what i mean um but for me it's all about respect it's all about you knowing who i am that rep that reputation uh, preceding me and understanding that whenever you see me on a marquee, whenever you see me um, getting ready for a match, whenever you see me, wherever I'm at, you're going to get uh, everything you paid for. You're going to get your money's worth and you're going to get one hell of a show from me. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to take a minute to tell you about my friend and big supporter of the show, Apparel Line, Ruddy Lad. My wardrobe is filled with these t-shirts. They're so comfortable, and I am not the only one who feels this way. You can find celebrities enjoy them too. Everyone from WWE's Big E, Sheamus, Ronda Rousey, and Travis Brown, UFC icon Chuck Liddell, and Conor McGregor's training team, to the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Bono from U2, Phil X from Bon Jovi, and actors too, such as Chad Michael Murray, and so many more. Ruddy Ladd was also featured on Dragon's Den on Netflix. So head over to ruddylad.com, help support them, and make sure raise some proper mischief. You talk about respect and reputation, and that has done you very well in Ring of Honor because you are the 22nd mm. Ring of Honor World Television Champion. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, and that's, again, you know, you write down goals when you get into the sport, things you want to do, places you want to see, things you want to accomplish, and, you know, when I was sitting down with uh, another good friend of ours, Ray Rowe, you know, who's been so influential to me in my career and my life in general, you know, godfather to my daughter's art, our history is well documented. Um, one of the goals was to get to Ring of Honor. Another one was to get to Japan. Um, and to be able to see the things that he's checked off his list is absolutely remarkable. Um, but even more so for me, um, wanting to make history and, and wanting to be able to be someone that um, established a, a legacy somewhere um, was important to me, especially becoming a champion, you know, and in this sport, in this industry, there's not really a lot of guys like myself, especially African-American males that become champions of note. Now, when I say that, a lot of people will be like, well, the, the, the there's a lot of champions and that's not what I mean. Like there's very few that are the guy. There's very few that are seen as the number one spot without question. There's always an asterisk or there's always a mid-level sort of area where we thrive, but breaking through to that top echelon has always proved very, very difficult except for some. Um, and, and, and a few rare cases have made it through guys like the rock guys like ron simmons or bo gritty or, or kofi kingston you know um and it's been incredibly inspirational to to see that but um you also have guys like jay lethal right and going to ring of honor was important for me because in the history of the company there's only been one guy that has reached the top of that mountain that looks like me and that's him um and so for me trying to make history or wanting to be in positions to make history to me it's very important to be able to learn from guys who have done it if i'm going to try to walk a path it's very important that i seek out knowledge and as much as i can from people who have already walked that path right so for me it was a no-brainer to go to ring of honor um, because if i want to try to achieve that level of history that level of success um, there's no better guy to learn from than from him, you know, and you also have guys like Kenny King, you know, who have won the ring of honor television championship on two occasions. So the only African-American males in the damn near 20 year history of this company to win the championship that I did were Kenny King and Jay Lethal and myself. So I'm already taking those steps to make that history, you know, and I have no plans on, on stopping now. Um, and there's just, uh, there's more to come. I've been. <laughs>
Well, that's definitely, I mean, those two names, very well known in professional wrestling, two of the Mm -hmm. highest names that you can even compare yourself to. And, Mm -hmm. you know, to say that you are in that same level with them is just amazing, especially like you said, you're still not at your peak. You still have so much more to go. So, I mean, you could even surpass them and be someone who is just synonymous with Ring of Honor wrestling not just as a black man, but as a wrestler, you can't right. take everything. You can't take anything away from you. And that's and that's literally been the entire goal, right? I, I've told anybody that's that's asked me. I go, I love the history that Ring of Honor has. I I, I love the fact that you've had. No, no. Stop being nosy. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> love you. Um, I, I love the fact that, you know, so many great athletes and performers have come through our doors. I also, while honoring the past, I don't want to be fixated on it. Like, there's more than just what CM Punk and Samoa Joe did. There's more than just what Brian Danielson and Nigel McGinnis did. And I'm not discounting anything at all. It's absolutely legendary what they did. But as long as you're talking about them, you're not talking about what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. As long as you're t- like, there's a reason that people talk about Tom Brady and Drew Brees and guys like that now, and they're not still talking about Johnny Unitas. You know what I mean? Like, definitely. You have to talk about what's in front of you, right? The game progresses. Um, and, and so for me, I want my era in Ring of Honor with all the talent that we have, with, with, with as many people that are as synonymous with this company as they are like a Taven, like a Lethal, like a Jay Briscoe, or both the Briscoes rather, you know, and I, at the end of my time, whenever that is, I want my era, my name to be as synonymous as theirs is in my era with all of them being there, right? Mm -hmm. So when people look back, they go, yeah, they were great. Yeah, they were legends, but that was Shane's era of Ring of Honor and he proved it every single day. And to be able to be seen in that, to be seen as the franchise, to be able to be be seen as the guy, you know, regardless of any other factor, at the end of the day, you're going to have to respect who I am, not just as a Black wrestler, not just as a Black man, but, but as a guy who dominated my sport and did so exactly the way I wanted to do it. Not the corporate way, not the... Uh, easiest way to you know avoid controversy not none of that I did it my way exactly how I wanted to do it unapologetically me and that's fantastic and you know you are dominating not just ring of honor but wrestling in general a lot of people know who you are and in, that includes PWI which this year you were ranked 65 in the mm. top 500 of the PWI I mean, what a great accomplishment to add to your list of accolades that you already have. Yeah, like it's it's crazy too because like when, when I first started, I I saw those lists and and they hold so much weight, you mm-hmm. know. What I mean, early, right? And then you kind of understand how some of the things work, you know what I mean? And so you're like, okay, right? But I remember just last year, I was like 260 something, mm-hmm. right? And I laugh because I go, there's not a person on this planet that can name 260 wrestlers better than me. You can't. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, Now, now maybe that's just me being confident, cocky, whatever you want to call it. But I feel like we all have to have that to be successful in this sport. Now, am I going to say that I'm the best wrestler in the entire world? No. You know what I mean? But I'm very good at what I do, right? Mm -hmm. So styles make fights. But I can tell you, I, I felt the same last year as I do this year. There wasn't 260 something wrestlers better than me last year. There aren't 60 something but wrestlers better than me this year. Like you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I appreciate uh, the the 200 slot bump. You know, it, it's much appreciated. But again, I I don't feel as though um, there are 60 something wrestlers better than me. There's just I just don't feel that way. Um, but that's that also gives me as a person who loves to um, have a chip on their shoulder for something and I operate best in that environment and in that headspace, uh, they just gave me another one. You know what I mean? So 
if if I don't get them, I'll manufacture them. You know what I mean? So <laughs> this is just this is just one of those things. So now I get to go out there and prove, you know, that there aren't sixty something wrestlers better than me. Uh, that I am one of the very best in the world, uh, and I'll continue to showcase that. And that's like confidence is such a huge thing within wrestling. I mean, you've said it many times because if mm -hmm. you don't have the confidence in yourself, then nobody else is going to see that you, exactly. know, you can amount to anything. If you don't have confidence in your complete bag of nerves or, you know, just whatever, you no will not last. Yeah. You and you will won't last. not last. You will drown. We are swimming in an industry of sharks. You will. And, and like, and it's not even like one of those things that's just like, Oh, it's so terrible. Like, no, this is just, this is competition. This is mm -hmm. what this is. This is the real world. I know we're in a society now that acts like those things don't exist, but they do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like losing is a real thing. Not meeting your goals is a real thing. Like not performing well and being punished for that is a real thing. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so in, in this sport, like, yes, you're, it's a different kind of competition, but you're competing with everybody for attention, for viewers, for fans, for merch sales. You're, you're competing with yourself to see if you can outdo, you know, what you did last year. You're competing with your contemporaries to see if you can outperform them. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's high levels of competition to this and I'm not someone that likes to lose. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I hate losing. So um, a anytime I feel like anybody's ahead of me in anything, then that just means I have to push that much harder uh, to make everybody understand who the man is. And I think for you, especially that that's something that you stay consistent on, because like I said, it, ever since I met you 15 years ago, it's been a constant, constant build. There's mm -hmm. like, if for some reason you stumbled, I never knew about it because you didn't let that be known because mm -hmm. you don't, you need that confidence to be number one. Like you said, the competition in the wrestling industry is insane. Yeah, right now there's a number of companies that you could possibly work for that are considered mm -hmm. great, but in each company, there's only, like you said, one person to be the man at that time. And you're constantly got to up in your game to try to get to that position every time. Absolutely. You know, and, and everybody stumbles, right? And mm -hmm. so for me, what, what that amounts to is having the right people around me at the right time that allow that help pick me back up because I for sure have, have, have stumbled. I, and, you know, just a few years ago, you know, I was almost done. Like I was telling my wife, you know, things weren't really going the way that I wanted them to. And I, I felt like, you know what, I, I put enough into this, you know, my daughter was getting bigger and it was just like, I've got to figure out which path that I want to take, you know? And she looked up, she looked up, she looked at me and said, if you stop now, you're never going to forgive yourself, right? Like you're always going to have that. What if you'll, you'll be angry. You won't, you won't feel fulfilled. So, um, talk to Ray, talk to her and, you know, they both kind of said the same thing. And so kept at it, you know, just went even harder. And then fast forward the next year, year or two, I'm the ring of honor world television champion and things have done, you know, things have skyrocketed for me. So, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the cliche stuff that you hear, you know, it's always darkest before the dawn type stuff. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff that you hear, those, those things tend to be pretty accurate, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you're always going to be tested the most right before you succeed. So for me, anytime that I get to that point and I feel like, damn, you know, it's just not, it's not, it's not working right or it's not moving. I just keep pushing harder because I know just on the other side of that is exactly where I want to be. And it's so great that you have this support system around you, not just your friends, but your wife, you got more family that's even behind you. And I mean, without people supporting you, there's no way that you can in the independent wrestling. It's so hard already because oh, yeah. you're on the road so much, you know, some of the people that you do meet that you think are your friends aren't necessarily your friends. They don't have your best intentions at heart, but yeah. you do have, <laughs> a few core people that you know you can always count on and in wrestling that i think is the greatest thing is when you have that support system that just gives you what you need to push forward and that's it's 100 percent true and that's invaluable that's why you know i put a i put a heavy heavy price on on, on loyalty 
um, and, and having those people around me, you know what I mean? And keeping e each other accountable, you know? And there's there's been numerous times, right? Where me and Ray have not talked for weeks, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, cause I, cause I did some shit, you know what I mean? Or, or, or said some shit or, you know, it was just wiling out, you know what I mean? And he had to fucking check me and I was pissed about it, but you know, it is that that's why he's there. You know, he's my big brother for a reason. He's not there to just tell me things that I want to hear. He tells me things that I have to hear and I need to hear. Um, and plus the closest people to me know that a, a motivated and pissed off Shane Taylor gets shit done. Absolutely. And sorry for, sorry for cussing at this <laughs> PG podcast, but it's um, the internet. It doesn't matter. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn, I'm cussing a lot. Yeah. But like they 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 know a pissed off Shane Taylor gets stuff done, and they're willing to go through that, and kind of weather that storm in order to in order for me to to succeed and get to where I need to be. Because then it's like, see, was that so hard? Why do you have to have to be so hard at it? This could have been done. You know what I mean? It's just like yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? Like, um, but they they know the best ways to motivate me and give and get me where I need at where I need to be. So. Um, Without them, I I wouldn't be where I'm at. So I'm I'm very great. I'm grateful to everybody that's in my corner. And that's fantastic, Shane. You are just like, I love when I talk to you. And like I said, it's been quite a long time since we've seen each other. But let's go ahead and tell everybody all your social media so they can keep up with you on the regular and take it from there. All right. Of course, you know uh, Twitter and Instagram at Shane Two One Six Taylor. Um, head on over to ROHWrestling.com. Uh, go check out the Shane Taylor Promotions merchandise, uh, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Shane Taylor, all lowercase. Check out the merchandise there. Um, I, I limit my social media, sp especially now, just to keep my sanity. You know what I mean? But uh, for everybody that does want to that does want to show support, thank you so much. It's been an incredible. Whew, 13 year career now you know what I mean like um I, I I can't thank you guys enough you know you you've been able to help me provide an incredible lifestyle for myself and my family uh you know and hell who knows here's here's to another 13 you know what I'm saying <laughs> that's right Shane all the best to you your family and everybody that you love thank you so much for doing this thank you appreciate it anytime bye Thank you, Shane Taylor, so much for sharing all of his stories with us here today on Talking Sass. He's such a great guy, and I hope you guys got to learn a lot more about him. Don't forget to follow him on social media, Shane216Taylor. And uh, yeah, and now on to my last guest, as promised, a wrestling history lesson. So without further ado, here is my good friend and wrestling historian, Dan Murphy. I have Dan Murphy, who is a former PWI senior writer for over 22 years. He has a new book in the making, plus he has the Sisterhood of the Squared Circle that's also available. Hey, Dan, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Steph? I'm doing real good. And like I was saying, this is a super extra for my podcast, because what we're going to do every month with you is talk a little bit about wrestling history. That's good. That's what I, uh, that's what I know. So I think that works out well. Definitely. And speaking of, I mentioned you have a new book on the way, The Wrestler's Wrestler. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, The Wrestler's Wrestlers. It's the idea of, uh, if you've ever heard the expression, the musician's musician or a comedian's comedian, it's not the guys who are or girls who are necessarily the most famous, but it's the ones that all of their peers look up to. And uh, that's uh, the case in pro wrestling. So The Wrestler's Wrestlers, people like Brad Armstrong, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, um, all the way throughout wrestling history, Luna Vachon. And that comes out this spring with ECW Press. And of course, I also have, as you mentioned, Sisterhood of the Squared Circle, the complete history of women's pro wrestling. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing my wrestling writing. And that's amazing. And such a great book. I've read that one, of course, The Sisterhood. And let's talk about a little bit of women's history for the month of October. Well, I, I decided to, for this little segment, um, it's not October, it's actually November, but I thought it was the uh, a really good thing to take a look at right now. Okay. Um, because of uh, intergender wrestling is, is such a big thing. And uh, Steph, how many, do you have any idea how many intergender matches you, you worked? 
Oh, goodness. Um, I would say probably somewhere around like 15, 20. I wasn't really into the intergender scene as much as some of my uh, other sisters. Okay. When do you think the, well, when do you re- think the first or, or when intergender wrestling became a thing? Like not counting Andy Kaufman and, and the kind of gimmick stuff. Um, can you think of the first time that you think that intergender wrestling might've taken place? Well, I would say probably the 1980s. I mean, not including the Andy Kaufman, but probably like on the circus scene and stuff, maybe the yep. independent, the pre-independent days. The territorial days, yeah. Yes. And there were a few that happened, some kind of mixed tag matches in the 60s and 70s. But one I thought Mm. that would be really interesting to kind of mention today, uh, Thanksgiving 1980 in Georgia Championship Wrestling. And the booker was Bill Watts. And Bill Watts, you know, was not a... uh, he was a very old school guy. He's not the kind of guy who'd be into, you know, the progressive ideas with wrestling, very traditional. But he was inspired by the idea of the battle of the sexes, the uh, text, the tennis match between uh, Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs from about six years earlier. And he decided he was having a uh, tag team tournament, men's tag team tournament. And just for, you know, giggles, basically, he decided to put in a women's team. So in the opening round, he had, uh, it was Steve-O and Jerry Roberts, who went on to be Jacques Rougeau. And, hey, you know, we were talking early before we went on about Quebec. So yeah. Really nice, against a team of Joyce Grable and Judy Martin. And it was uh, presented, you know, kind of the fans all thought, you know, 12,000 people, 1980, Thanksgiving uh, at the Omni in Atlanta. And they thought this would just be a, a, a train wreck, you know, like mm-hmm. the, the men were just going to destroy the women. But what happened is the women going into the match worked as heels, not baby faces. Ooh. You would think the women, you know, they're the underdogs. So the underdog story, what they did is they kind of cut promos saying how, you know, the, the great thing about being a woman is you can marry a man and then leave him and then take half of his belongings and never have to do anything. <laughs> Total heel. And, and the fans hated that. So they, they kind of wanted to see the underdogs get their tails kicked. And instead, the women went out and out-wrestled the men. Now, when the match ended, the men won. But the women hung in there and earned a standing ovation from the crowd. And they had kind of the show of respect. And a month later, they had the big rematch in a tag team match in uh, December and Christmas Day, in fact. So here's this territory, Georgia Championship Wrestling, very traditional with, you know, Bill Watts as the booker. And they tried something completely unique and they put two women in there and said, go out there and wrestle like men. And not only did they wrestle like men, but they actually out wrestled the men. Now the men won in the end, but it got a whole new level of respect. And it was something that really showed people that women in the right position and with the right booking can really deliver the goods. That is a fantastic first, like, history lesson. I'm done. I love it. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. I actually have met both Judy Martin and uh, Joyce Grable, and I wish that I would have heard that story from them as well, because I'm sure the firsthand, like, story from them being in it would have been just so much more elaborate on what was happening backstage with them. Especially what... because the men didn't want to wrestle because they were really, they were young. They were both yeah. very young and they didn't know, like, how do you, how do you lock up with women? Like, how do you, how do you touch them without it being offensive? You know, they were very worried about that. And the women were just like, basically, we don't care. We'll get this done. Don't be a jerk. We'll get it done. Don't worry about it. Grab us like you would grab a guy. And that's how the match goes. And uh, they, they made it work. Oh man, I love that story. I can't wait to see what you have for us each month because that was brilliant. Fantastic. And you can read a lot more about it. Sisterhood of the Squared Circle. Order your copy today. That's right. Make sure you go out and you order that book. Actually, you don't even have to go out with quarantine and all. You can stay in, order it on Amazon and bam, comes to your door. All right, Dan, thank you so very much. We look forward to having you again next month. I look forward to it. Thank you, Steph. You're welcome. Bye-bye.